Hey, how's it going? Uh, this is the Sommelier AMA, uh, and we are providing the latest for liquidity providers. Um, and we are talking to Aloy Liu uh, from the Kyber Protocol, uh, one of the co-founders of Kyber, uh, one of the sort of OGs of the of the DeFi space, uh, and talking about what's the latest for Kyber and how the AMM space has been evolving. It's great to talk to you again. Hey, thank, thanks, uh, Zaki, for having me. Hi, hi, everyone. Um, this is fantastic. Um, so, yeah, um, we, if we get any questions from the, the, the audience, I'll relay them. Um, but why don't we, we start out? So, um, you know, I think probably maybe the, 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 the like, the, maybe the right place to start is a little bit of sort of the history of Kyber and, what is what are what are the what is the latest protocol version of the protocol and uh, and uh, uh, what is what are the unique features that it brings to the DeFi space? Sure. Um, yeah. So you know we started Kyber uh, together with a couple of uh, other co-founders uh, back in 2017 uh, when we saw you know basically that I think that was the the year uh, that many of the uh, well-known decentralized uh, agendas, uh, you know, uh, kick off, right? So I think in that year, we, we had like Zero X, uh, S-Swap, uh, Omisego, and also like Kyber. Um, and uh, basically our model back then was that uh, we, we we really like wanted like to support uh, the professional market makers uh, to allow them like, to efficiently, uh, uh, you know, doing uh, market making on chain. Uh, so we we uh, architect and and design our uh, our protocol around that idea, uh, and and I think to date, uh, you know that we still have like, several professional market makers doing market making uh, with Kyber uh, using our protocol. Um, uh, but I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna share a little on like you know why uh, it it didn't like you know take off. Uh, as much as other uh, AMM protocol. I'm sure everybody would like to know. I mean, that's always the, the biggest insight, right? Right, right. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, so that was uh, that that was the original design and purpose of Kyber. Uh, and, and later on, of course, you know, uh, the, the, the space evolved so fast and, and, and there have been like a lot of like new innovation happening. Uh, so, you know, at Kyber, we also have like, uh, uh, you know, our, our own IMD team who um, recently uh, produced and also like develop and, and, and we built uh, what we call uh, the DMM or the Dynamic Market Maker, um, which is, I think, uh, a, a more advanced version of the traditional AMM. Um, do, do, do you want me like, to share about them now? or, or that's Yeah, absolutely. Now? That would be great to hear. Uh, what What okay. is special about the DMM? Right, so uh, basically DMM, uh, uh, I think, um, okay, so the in DMM, we introduced uh, two very cool features. Uh, one of that is a, is a capital efficiency uh, that we also, I think recently Uniswap V3 also introduced that. Uh, basically you can, uh, you know, concentrate or, or uh, so I think we use the term amplified the liquidity that you have uh, given the same inventory uh, by narrowing the price range that you want to support for the token pair in the pool. Um, so you, and were, the second you were Uniswap B3 before Uniswap B3 was Uniswap B3. Very, very, very yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so we, I mean, like, I think the approach to, uh, to achieve uh, the liquidity uh, efficiency, uh, sorry, the capital efficiency is basically the same. Uh, I think we announced so, probably like a couple of months before Uniswap V3, uh, mm -hmm. but I but I believe like the the the, the two uh, were discovered uh, independently. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay, so one one was amplified liquidity. What was the other feature? Uh, the other one is uh, what we call the uh, dynamic uh, LP fees. Uh, basically, what we have seen in other project uh, is that you know the LP fees are are basically fixed or, you know, it's, it's constant, right? Like once you set up the LP fees, that's it. Um, and this LP fee doesn't, uh, you know, fluctuate or, or it, 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 do, it doesn't like, you know, get affected by the market condition or, or things like that, right? Um, so, uh, but what we observe from uh, the traditional market makings uh, by professionals is that 
um, you know, when the market changes, uh, the fees or the spread will change as well, right? So, so we wanted like to to sort of like reflect that in uh, in uh, DMM. Uh, so basically, in DMM, there's a there's a there's a nice feature to adjust the LPPs based on the market condition, right? So when the market is like volatile, uh, the LPPs will be increased um, uh, to basically like protect the liquidity providers. So when you're um, using it, when you're when you're so what are the inputs into the LPPs? Um, so the LPPs will take into account uh, the movement of the trade volume. Uh, I think we use some moving average function uh, based on the volume uh, to determine like when to increase LP fees. Okay. Fascinating. Um, right. Yeah. Um, I mean, the only other project that I'm aware of that is doing dynamic LP fees is Thorchain. Um, and we've had them on in a previous episode and Thorchain's LP fees are, I think, slippage based. Um, so depending on how much like slippage there is in the pool, um, the, if the slippage is high, the LP fees go up um, to try and bring in more capital to sort of bring down uh, I see. Uh, 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 slippage. I think that's, I the, think that, that's one of the, I, the, one of the, right. one of the mechanisms that I've, I'm familiar with. I think that's the approach that uh, one inch also use, uh, uh, you know, in the in in the AML. Yeah. Um, yeah. I I, I heard of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah. So basically, I think I think um, you know I think uh, this this has been done in the traditional market like for for you know decades, right? And we just like wanted like to uh, sort of like bring it back to the AMM space. Uh, of course, you know, there are going to be a lot of ways for you to determine when you want to uh, increase the LPPs, right? Um, so I think based on the slippage is one way, uh, based on the, you know, uh, market moving based on the volume is another way. And I think uh, there could be uh, potentially a lot of other ways that people can can try to experiment with uh, for, on this topic. Um. So as a liquidity provider, and I'm trying to figure out where to put my liquidity, um, how, do, how, how, should I, how should I think about, you know, where is, you know, on what tokens, on what pairs is putting my liquidity into the uh, DMM potentially like the best way that I'm going to, to maximize my profits as a, as a liquidity <coughs> provider? I think, um... Okay, so DMM is actually uh, a lot simpler for the for the retail uh, LPs uh, to provide liquidity because uh, usually there was the, the okay. So given the same pair of of, uh, of tokens, um, um, there would be like one or two like you know pools that would stand out in terms of like liquidity, right? And I think uh, the best liquidity pool will will attract the the, the most volume. Uh, and and uh, essentially, it will really return um, the the uh, you know better for the LPs. Mm -hmm. um, so um, so DMM is configured uh, in a way that the pool creator uh, will just fix the price range, um, and also like uh, basically they 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 choose how they want to amplify the liquidity into the, in the pool, right? Um, uh, instead of uh, so so basically the LP providers they don't have uh, uh, you know, uh, they don't have to pick which price range that they want to support uh, because once they put liquidity in the pool, uh, you know, there's the, the price range is already fixed. Uh, if they want to have their own uh, price range, then they have to set their, their, their own pool, uh, which not many people will do. So the, the I think one of the things that I think, I guess, is novel about this is to so the pool creator, um, is setting the price range here, and then everyone who adds liquidity in their pool just inherits that price range. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that could be very. I mean, that can be very handy for, especially for for bootstrapping liquidity off of a new token. Um, where right. I think one of the most complicated things, you know, that we Sommelier has been trying to build tooling around, um, 
has been for Uniswap LPs, like pick, picking picking ranges, um, uh, right. and and you know the that does seem like a very cool feature of the DMM to be able to be like, hey, like okay, someone else potentially someone with a reason to have you know some uh, some beliefs about the price um, pick the pool range. Um, so how is the DMM being integrated into the rest of the DeFi space? Because I think we're starting to see more and more trading being routed through aggregators rather than people going directly to the user interface, right? Right. I think, um, yeah, I think, uh, I think we have seen this uh, aggregated trend uh, for almost a year already. And uh, that's why I think most of the traffic to DMM also like, you know, uh, are routed via, uh, you know, the, the well-known aggregators, like uh, I think uh, one inch and zero PI, uh, matcha and paraswap as well. Um, and I think that, that should be the, the way for the, for the retail traders, right? Because I think um, like, like even, uh, even if you have like the best liquidity, uh there might also like you know uh, always be some benefit of splitting the trade into like two different pools right mm. um uh so, so so i think that's that's something that the aggregator does really well uh uh since they are connected to like you know all the available liquidity uh, pools yeah so that's that's fantastic that the, the, the that you know uh, for liquidity providers, you know that they're that they're seeing the traffic from the aggregators, um, and it seems like it's it, you know it seems like the DMM is like just like another tool in the toolkit, right? For a liquidity provider um, to try and figure out, you know, it gives you some of the ben you know, gives you some of the capital efficiency of Uniswap V3, but you uh, you could you could go into a pool that already exists. Um, right. I so think. Um Go ahead. I, I think I, I think I just want to uh, comment a little bit, uh, uh, you know, about uh, the the DMM approach and also like the Uni V3 approach. I think there's uh, pros and cons in in both of them, right? Of course, you know, Uni Uni V3 is much more flexible for the LPs, uh, but I think for the retail LPs, I'm not sure whether they they are uh, they, they they know enough to pick the price range for them, right? Um, and um, and I think uh, I think for most of them, uh, probably probably the wizards will follow whatever is default uh, uh, is given uh, to them by default, right? Um, so I think in DMM, we just want to make it like you know super easy and super like basically like seamless for the LPs. Uh, basically, you know th these are the pools that are already like amplified uh, in liquidity, right? So why don't you just like contribute the, the liquidity there? instead of like, you know, asking them to pick their own price range. Yeah, I think that, I, I honestly think it's a, it, it's a it, you know, the high level of this approach actually kind of makes a lot of sense to me and I think is very powerful. Um, so I think that's, I think that's really cool. Um, what's, what's, what's kind of coming up for Kyber? What, what's, what does the future hold? Um, um, DMM is out there. Yeah, so we have a we have a couple of things uh, that uh, that uh, you know we have been spending a lot of time with the team. One of that is uh, you know is the next version of DMM. Uh, so we currently we have like a few uh, sort of like uh, uh, things that we can still improve at DMM. One of that is uh, we want the uh, basically basically once the pool is created, the price range is fixed, right? Uh, but we want to have the ability to basically upgrade the the pool or you know adjust the price range, uh, uh, you know once we see the market has been changed, right? Um, and uh, the and the other one is, uh, um, yeah, and and, uh, and 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 the other one is is that uh, you know we have been like um, we have been looking at at, at layer two as well. Um, and we have been like doing some experiment uh, with layer tools. Um, so one of the initi initiative that the team has been working on is, you know, some basically AMM focused layer two that we probably uh, uh, that that we have like a, a couple of like very cool features 
like uh, you know we could prevent like fund running on that layer two we can decentralize the the layer two operators as well because one of the thing that that we see as a disadvantage uh, in, in in layer two is that the the layer two operators is usually the centralized party right so basically they can do like you know uh, many things that that um that that they want to uh you know fund run the users or, or to like you know do censorship and things like that um yeah so that's the that's something that we have been like working on i mean it's a pretty pretty exciting time on uh layer twos now you know you have uh you know uniswap launching on optimism uh you know the layer two promise that we've been hearing about for you know these last four years finally is becoming real um, right uh it's fine it's becoming real it's becoming fantastic um and so all of that seems really exciting um yeah i mean what's your take on sort of how the layer two space and DeFi is going to play out i think DeFi is uh getting more and more stable um i think um i think uh i think there are there are probably like a, a couple of like trends or a couple of like movements that i'm seeing in DeFi. One of that is to really like you know get the institutions uh, involved, right? I think uh, you know we, we, we've been seeing the like Ave and Compound, uh, uh, you know, trying to do that, um, and um, and uh, even in Asia, I think there are, there are several like you know crypto funds that wanted like, to bring the 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 you know traditional uh, uh, capitals right from all the banks and and financial institutions. Uh, to 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 bring them to DeFi because you know if you if you are talking about like something like eight to ten percent uh, yield on your stable annual, that's you know very high in the traditional market, right? Like in Singapore, yep. we are seeing something like two or three percent, um, and 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 you know there there are a lot of like capital out there that are just waiting to be deployed. Uh, so yeah. I think that's, that's 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 a really good. But of uh, course, uh, as that as that capital comes in, it is going to probably push down yields quite a bit. So. Uh, yeah, so that's totally possible. That's totally possible. Yeah, um, and um, well, you know, I think it's really cool. I think it's I think it's really just phenomenal that like, you know, you know, the ability to kind of have something with the user experience of a savings account. But like you are providing liquidity to like various people who are speculating, who are taking out loans, uh, who are you know participating in liquidations, like all of these opportunities that like you know to put that capital to use that just like you know ordinary people and many institutions just don't have. Um, you know, right. that really opens it up. It is it it continues to be an, an incredible achievement. Um, yeah, I I mean I. Yeah. I I'm I'm just I'm 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 incredibly impressed at how many things that work have been found in DeFi um, and how quickly. Um, like it's just it's really it's really staggering. But you know, I also think I think we're we're I don't know if I agree with you that we're like stabilizing. I I still think that there's just like so much to explore. Um, you know. Right. <laughs> Maybe stable. Stable is not the right word. Uh, pro, uh, <laughs> I, I feel like there's some consolidation around some things. Right. Work. Right. 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 Yes. Um, yeah. You yeah. know the 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 you know the re the reliability of stablecoin liquidity pairs. Um, you know those sorts of things have started to become like really powerful and useful tools that are have seemed to have you know that have very well understood risks exactly and and and, and i think it's you know it's fascinating to see like uh, uh, even like you know the the trade volume of stable coins on decentralized trading platforms like uniswap and and, and others actually like you know much more than than uh, the centralized one right so that really show the the uh, you know that decentralized platform can actually handle uh, that much volume, that much traffic uh, compared to the to the centralized one. I I, I still remember uh, a couple of years ago we we still said that like you know we are still far away from uh, beating the centralized one uh, and 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 uh, but you know it's it's, it's really a, a really fast market right everything moves so fast and uh, I I you know I 
I'm, I'm just surprised that we uh, we arrive uh, at this stage much faster than than I uh, than I expected. Yeah, I, I'm with you. It's, everything's happened like way faster than it seemed. Yep. Um, yes, I think speaking of layer two, I think um, I think my view is that uh, in terms of layer two, we are still early, early in a way that we, uh, we first of all we don't see a major adoption from layer two yet. I mean, of course, a lot of projects are working on it. Uh, a lot of like new things are you know you know coming out from uh, all the layer two teams, uh, but. I think um, we, uh, I think we are still early in terms of like you know, to see whether layer two will have any impact on the actual adoption uh, that that uh, that we are having on DeFi, right? Because I think it's going to change a lot of like user flow, user experience, and things like that. Um, and I think one of the most important thing is also the composability, right, between uh, between different DeFi platforms. Yep. Um, yeah, I think I think that's that's a big topic that uh, not many people haven't really addressed. Uh, uh, you know, we are seeing like um, several layer two uh, frameworks that allow uh, that allow uh, you to actually operate the, the the full EVM within that that layer two, right? Uh, yeah. But I think there's there's going to be a huge uh, trade off in terms of like performance and and even like the risk model and things like that. Uh, so I don't think it's going to be that straightforward. Um, so that's why our approach in layer two is that, you know, we are going to make it like use case specific for now. Uh, you know, let's just forget uh, about all the other use cases, right? Uh, let's just forget about composability. Let's just, you know, have one use case, uh, deliver it with really good user experience uh, so that people get the taste of what layer two uh, is, right? Um, yep. Um, of course, I think I think you know, I think the space is heavily investing in layer two, and uh, I'm I'm sure that we are gonna we're gonna you know get something really solid soon. Yeah, I like I said, you know, I I, I would say that I you know I I've said this earlier today. I was like, you know, I think you know 2017 to 2020, I thought it was pretty clear how this space was going to play out um you know it was you know i think that there i think there were you know a lot of questions about whether or not sort of ethereum could overcome a bunch of its challenges i i feel like it's made a lot of progress um on that front uh you know there there were other questions you know, but you know it was inevitable that we were going to get other working layer ones um you know and i think you know once once the sort of uh, once the layer two roadmap shifted away from sort of being so plasma centric uh, and so state channel centric and went to these kind of roll up based designs, um, you know, whether they're application specific or general purpose EVM, uh, you know, I think that that still has a long way to play out in the same way that like application specific layer ones versus um, versus smart contract layer ones. It's also uh, an experiment that is still uh, we're, it's, it's still going to take some quite some time to play out. Um, right. But, you know, we have, uh, we've kind of, a lot of things have all moved in a very sensible way. And now I just think it's like very difficult to foresee where all of this stuff ends right, up. Right, right. I think, uh, I think you just brought up one topic that, uh, that I, I don't, I don't think many people actually realize that is happening. That is layer one use case specific. Um, so, so I think several projects already uh, like have their own chain, right? That like like their own layer one that that serve, uh, you know, solely the purpose of uh, of of, of, the, of the project. Um, I think we saw uh, Compound, right? Compound yep. announced their their own chain, and then I think Axie has their own chain as well. Um, so, so this is quite interesting because like once once you know the project has some sort of like adoption, they will the, they will like immediately start like thinking about how to uh, actually like you know create something uh, that that will serve their own users better, right? That will serve their own use case better. Yep. Um, and the, and so, the dynamics around making an app your own layer one and making your own layer two, uh, 
either one application specific, either an application specific layer one or an application are very similar. And like the user interface trade-offs are gonna be very similar. And like things like bridges to Ethereum and, uh, uh, and you know, IBC exists now and all of these pieces, they, they're, they're very quickly gonna be commoditized. Um, right. So they're right, just going right. to be everywhere. So you're going to, you know, you're going to have your layer one, layer two interoperability. You're going to have your inter layer one oper interoperability. Um, and there's just going to, and yeah, I, I, it's, it's, it's difficult now that we have all, we have produced all of these tools to really, to really have like a, a, a full analysis of, of what's going on. Also, it's just generally like, there's just so much happening every single day. Um, you know, there's so much information to consume, you know, oh, I've really been enjoying doing these, uh, these uh, uh, AMAs with all these different DeFi projects, because I almost always learn something, right? I, right. I, I, I haven't, it, like, we're, we're long past the days when, uh, when I would, I could just keep up with everything from crypto Twitter and going to conferences and reading papers, like, right, right, right. Giant fire, <laughs> fire hose of information. Um, <laughs> Cool. Um, let me go look and see if there are any questions that popped in. I didn't see anything, but nope. Okay. We do have a lot of viewers, though. We have over 100 people watching. Um, That's good. That's good. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, it's good. And as I, you know, as I was saying, we pick up a long tail from, uh, from when we put it on YouTube, but this is, this is going well. Um, let's see what else. You know, we have a few minutes left. Is there anything else you, you're, excited about are you in singapore what's what's how, how are things there oh uh i'm supposed to be in singapore but uh, i'm currently in hanoi hanoi vietnam uh so we have uh, we have a development team here and i'm stuck here due to COVID. uh yeah. you know but uh i get traveling in asia is still hot uh <laughs> for most of the countries yeah um, yeah traveling anywhere is still hard i i, I don't really want to get on the plane <laughs> right right <laughs> uh yeah i think um you know i think i think the amm space is uh oh i think i forgot to share uh about our insight uh after we work with the professional mechanics yeah um, why, why, don't we, why don't we close with that it sounds fantastic right i think um okay so as i mentioned earlier uh we uh we basically like work with a lot of them uh probably up we probably talk to like up to 20 different like market making firms uh, basically, to invite them like, to you know to be on board, right? To to use our framework and to do uh, basically what we call professional uh, market making on chain. Um, so it was going well. I mean, like um, a, a few of them agree and actually like set up their team and to do some experiment and things like that. Uh, but then I think a, a couple of things that that really happened to uh, to uh, to uh, basically like uh, make it hard for them to to continue. Uh, I think the first one is the increase in the gas cost, right? I mean, like, I think it was, uh, it was basically if the gas stay at something like 10 or 20 giga away, they, they are still okay. But once it increased to something like 100 or above, it is like really hard for them because I think most of the, most of the revenue uh, will have it to be spent on uh, paying for the gas. Because one thing about, uh, uh, you know, professional uh, market making is that they have to frequently update the price. Although we already had uh, a, a really like nice and efficient framework for them to update, um, still the gas cost is extremely high uh, uh, for, for, for them to, to continue. Um, and I think the other one is that um, uh, I think when, okay, so when we, uh, when we started like seeing more traffic, uh, uh, g like given to the professional market makers, um, I think it was back in, uh, I think late 2018 and early 2019, or probably like, you know, middle of 2019. Uh, so back then I think the liquidity that they provided was really good, right? Like, like compared to uh, Uniswap and, and, and a few others. And uh, I think um, our, our volume and everything was still like, you know, uh, uh, I think compatible uh, to Uniswap and, and, and a few others as well. Um, but then liquidity mining happens. Uh, I think that 
is when uh, we we see that a lot of like capital uh, from retails uh, being put into other AMM pools, and you know the professional market makers they basically cannot beat uh, an AMM pool with a lot of capital in terms yep. of liquidity. So that was like you know really a, a shock for all the professional market makers uh, that that. That, that that were doing like um, you know on chain market making with Kyber, and they started like seeing less and less uh, volume uh, being routed to them, uh, and and eventually like you know you, they 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 couldn't continue. I think um, yeah, I think that that was a uh, that was uh, some some really like tough uh, uh, like condition and and, and uh, environment for the professional market makers to to operate. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Uh, no, yeah. I mean, I think I you know liquidity mining was like the defining has been the defining aspect of the space. Right. <laughs> right. 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 Uh, you know. I, I, you know. I. I think. I think the. You know. I think. You know. The system. You know. So. You know. The DMM sounds like a farmable system. Um, are, is there are there liquidity mining contracts on the DMM yet? Oh yeah, we have uh, we have a, a liquidity mining campaign on DMM. Um, so it's available on both uh, Ethereum and also Polygon. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time. I'm. Uh, sure you're eager to get on with your day and I'm eager to to go to sleep uh, but uh, yeah it's been really good catching up with you one oh yeah Thank, thanks for having me I think it's, it's been great uh, you know chatting with you and discussing a lot of topics <laughs> yeah uh, and hopefully I'll see you in real life in the not too distant future yep let's all hope that <laughs> all right okay have a good day okay, guys. okay. bye